Welcome friends, this is Sovereign Grace Doctrine. We start today with this video series now to look at the history of the New Testament church age and the Word of God. Now, this is something that we've been studying on and looking into for some time now. And for a couple of months now, our home church has had us teaching on this each Sunday morning. And we've gotten quite far into it. And we feel it's time now to bring it to our web page on the internet with uh, YouTube. And as we consider this, there's some things we want to think about. The condition is to how things were in the time of Christ and how do we get to where we are today. Now in the days of Christ, starting in 30 A.D. roughly, and A.D. means year of our Lord, an on dominion. And from the beginning of Christ coming and starting his ministry from 30 to roughly 33 something AD, uh, about three and a half years roughly, we find that our Lord stated this in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. He said, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. When the Lord said this, he had asked them the question, Whom do men say that I am? So the subject of the passage is, Who is Jesus? Not who is Peter. And when he said this to Peter, he said, Peter, you're but a little stone. But I am the rock. Christ is the rock. He is that massive living rock. He is that chief cornerstone that the builders rejected cornerstone upon which the foundation of the apostles are laid, upon which foundation we are built, his people, added to his local, visible, true New Testament churches, which he built the first one here. During his ministry, he brought together the members of it, and he chose them in particular. Christ said, I have chosen you. You have not chosen me. He said that to his apostles, but the same applies to each and every one of us that are saved by the grace of God. God has saved us, and if we follow him in baptism, then we are added to one of his true churches. That is, if we're, we follow uh, true believers' baptism, as we've talked about it, and if it is in truth done by a true believer, a true church that has the... Uh, love and responsibility to come forth and preach the gospel of this world, which the Lord started. But he started his church, and his believers, he called his people disciples at that time, but we're known as Christians today. And according to the information you find in 2020, there were 2.6 billion Christians worldwide. 2.6 billion Christians. What a marvelous thing. And that number, I believe, it's growing day by day as people are saved and come to the knowledge of the faith. According to the World Christian Encyclopedia in 2001, there were 1,200 different Christian denominations existing in the United States alone. 1,200. And you think about that now. Christ started his church. He built his church, his type of church, and we now live in a time when there are over 2.6 2, over 2 billion Christians in the world. And in the United States in particular, there's 12, over 1,200 different denominations. They claim Christ as their as Lord. Or maybe some don't really. But how do we get from what the Lord started to where we're at today, my friends? And that's what we hope to show you in this series of the history of this New Testament church age. For the church which the Lord built is in this time period. It did not exist before him. It did not exist in the B.C. time period before Christ. So, but uh, what about uh, where it talks about the church in the wilderness? Well, if you, know, if you understand what a church is, it is a called out assembly. That Greek word, ekklesia, is a called out assembly so, yes, there was a, a church in the wilderness. It was a called-out assembly. The called-out assembly of Israel was his people in the Old Testament. 
that was that group of people then which he'd worked through and dealt with and done mighty works in and through until this time which he is now after fulfilling all things and building his church he has turned from them to the Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy but for election's sake they are still the children of God they are still a nation which God has not done with and at the end of this age, the end of the church age, the Lord is going to turn back to them and work in and through them for seven more years. Now, 1,200 different Christian denominations in the United States alone. I don't know uh, what the, the uh, uh, who knows worldwide. Who knows really how many worldwide. That information is probably out there too. You can find this by anything you want on the, the internet now these, day, these days. But this also we find in the book of Matthew, chapter 24 and verse 35, book of Mark, chapter 13 and verse 31, book of Luke, chapter 21 and verse 33, this same statement is made in all three places. It says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. There in other places gives us the assurance of the eternal existence of the Word of God. It is always here for God's people to read and to know of Him by His Word. And that Word of God has come unto us, my friends. That great commission given to His church. Now we might uh, just step back from that a minute and think about these things also. That is, the great commission, technically, is the second commission given to the church of Jerusalem. Now you just don't hear people talk about the first one very much, and that is because, well, he gave them a commission first to go on to the lost sheep of Israel, go to Israel specifically. And after that, he also added 70 more to his church, and the 12 and the 70 were sent out two by two to preach the word of God, to preach the coming of the kingdom of God, and preach the gospel of repentance to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He came to them first, that he might fulfill all things, and all things were fulfilled under the law and the prophets and the Psalms. Not one jot or tittle of the law has passed away, but all that law which set in place that they fulfilled that ceremonial law and rolling over their sin debt year after year until the time that the Savior, that the Christ, should come. And Jesus the Christ, having died on the cross and shed his blood, was that sacrificial lamb which God provided who has cleansed us from all sins all of us from Old Testament time to now to the future all his people have been their debt has been paid by him now our Lord then also arising from the grave after three days and three nights we have the full assurance that the debt was paid it was accepted and that we have the hope also of the resurrection in through Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. Now, these foundations being set upon which the church stands and declares, we find that in this day, and at the time of Christ, my friends, they had the Hebrew Old Testament, but they also had the Old Testament in Greek. And we say, well, why is that? Well, about uh, 350, 320, 350 years prior to Christ coming, the, that part of the world was conquered by the Greeks. And so for over 300 years, they have been under the influence of the Greek culture and the Greek language. And after about uh, 50 to 20 years, roughly, uh, about the year 300 B.C., roughly, uh, they saw their young people learning Greek and their culture, learning the Greek language. So, and of course they still had their Hebrew language they were teaching their people, but to trade with the, the nations now which they were under the occupation of, they also had to learn Greek to communicate with them. And because of this, uh, the Jews, the Septuagint, which is Latin for 70, means that there were 70 Jewish scholars uh, that came together and they translated the Hebrew Bible and the Apocrypha that they had at that time over into Greek. See, most of the Apocrypha that is in play today that's being used is all from the Old Testament. 
and uh, we'll deal with more of that later. But they had the he at the time of Christ they had the Hebrew Old Testament and the Greek Old Testament, and that Old Testament being divided up into its sections of the the Torah, the five books of the law, the prophets and the Psalms and the poetry, things which we've gone over. And then there was also the Apocrypha, set aside differently, never looked upon by the Jews with the same authority, the same inspiration as the rest of it, and uh, no, neither did the early churches view it that way either. Yes, yeah, some of them read it. Some of the early Bibles had the Apocrypha, but you always had the Old Testament, the New Testament, and then the Apocrypha, separate. Never looked upon with the same authority as being fully inspired of God. You know, a lot of writings, a lot of writings besides the Bible and history that comes out of the B.C. time period. What makes something the Word of God? First of all, it's uh, throughout the Word of God we see the prophecies in the Old Testament foretelling of the coming of the Messiah. That's how you know Old Testament books are inspired of God. And none of the Apocrypha have. Not any of them. There's not one text in any of the Apocrypha of the Old Testament time period which is prophetic, looking to and declaring of the coming of the Savior. Now, and then you get to your New Testament time period, the New Testament books show the fulfilling of that, and it's in, through the Gospels. And then after the church being established, and we have the book of Acts. Now, we've gone over the book of Acts already, preaching through that. So as we, we're going to look at it, this kind of a general overview in this set of videos to get on beyond it to the rest of the history of the church. That book of Acts series, you ought to uh, listen to it first, and uh, then come back to this if you haven't listened to it already. Now, but in the book of Acts, the history and the works of the church began. The church doesn't begin there. It's already in existence from day one in the book of Acts. Now, the Lord established his church. He has given us his word. has given us full assurance that the word of God would be preserved throughout all the ages, my friends. Now, part of that great commission was that the gospel has to go into all the world and all nations. So what do we find? <coughs> September 2020, the full Bible, of a, as of that time, had been translated into 704 languages. Think about that. Now, my friends, we have a, a movement in the world today, uh, the idea that we need to go back to the Old Testament name of God. Why is that? That's rooted and grounded in Judaism. It's rooted and grounded in unbelieving Jews. What do they not believe in? They don't believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They have to accept Him and believe upon Him, and in His name only. His name is the only name given whereby we must be saved. Those Old Testament names of God will not save you. You can believe upon them all you want. You can say them all you want. But those Old Testament names of God will not save you. You have to believe upon the only begotten of the Father, Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. He is a part of the Godhead, part of that Trinity, that triune God. Holy, holy, holy is He. They knew that in the Old Testament times. They knew that God was more than one. When God said, let us make man in our image, He was talking about as a Trinity, that the Trinity was in, uh, in agreement to bring this to pass, yea, even before the foundation of the world, God made plans to save a people from amongst fallen man. God saw that man would fall into sin, and because he would fall into sin, he would be condemned. For God would have to condemn him, because God is a holy and a righteous God. He cannot overlook sin. He has to judge it. He had to pour that judgment somewhere. He had to put that judgment somewhere. So before he ever created anything, he made an agreement within himself. Before the foundation of the world, he, deci he decided he would save some. All were condemned. All of us. Those that are saved and those that are lost. We were all condemned. 
but only those that are saved and accept Christ and believe upon Him as Lord and Savior will go to heaven. And my friends, we all had to hear the preaching of the Word of God. It is by the preaching of the Word of God that God chose to save us by that foolishness. What I'm doing right now, it's foolishness, it says to those that perish. But it is by this means that God has foreordained that you might hear and believe and see your condition before God, that you're lost, that you're undone, you're wicked, you're depraved, and that all the things you do, all the things you think are sin and selfish. And that we must repent and turn from self and serve and believe upon holy and risen God, holy and righteous God. We must believe upon His Son, upon the Christ, Jesus, the Christ, the only begotten of the Father, who did indeed save us and fulfill all things. That gospel message is going to this world. It has gone out to the world in over 700 languages. and Perhaps, I'm sure there's more than that at this point. Well, it's just been a year. But they're working diligently to translate it into the languages that are still out there. But you people out there that have been uh, deceived and made to think, well, you got to go back to the Hebrew. you got to go back to those old names of God. No, that's Satan. That's Satan taking you away from that which God sent unto you, that in the name of Jesus and each of those languages. And I don't know what the name is in those other languages. I'm an English-speaking person. That name Jesus in German is something different. That name Jesus in Chinese or Korean or Russian or all those other 700 plus languages that have, are in the world or have been in the world. Those that spoke and understood those languages, that is the way in which God brought the gospel unto them. That they might hear and believe during their time of life in this world. Now. During the times of Christ, the Greek language was the prevailing language. So that is what they wrote the Word of God in, the Greek and the Hebrew. Now, at this time, there have been, according to what you can read online, more than 450 Bible translations into English have been done. Now, uh, some of those are probably not really true translations or transliterations or uh, you know they got so many different there's several different styles or several different methods and to truly translate means to take from or to carry over what it said and meant to your language uh, a lot of them that's not what it is a lot of them is just commentary it's just one man's opinion or they take the text and try to give you the thought of what they thought was being presented and thereby leaving out a lot of what it said and meant and in truth changing the thought. Beware, my friends, of modern Bibles. If you're not reading the King James Bible, and I'm talking about the authorized King James Bible, I don't even recommend the new King James. It's been changed. It's been altered. But we ought to read, we ought to use only the authorized King James Bible. Now, you can go back to 1611 if you want to, but it's, it's very hard to read. It has, uh, there's no, as far as doctrinal error, there's no doctrinal error. But there are misspellings and words. There's misprints. Uh, but they've upgraded it. They've uh, given it the modern language. They reset the type, corrected the spelling errors and that type of thing. But they did not change... From the beginning to the point of what we have now, they did not change the doctrinal statements of the Word of God. They did not change what it said. Those who say, oh, there's errors there, there's errors. No, there's no errors. Not in the authorized King James Bible, there's not. And the changes that were made do not change what it says and teaches. Now, We'll get into all that as we go on to this too. We're going to show you the history of this New Testament church age. And we've started here from the beginning. Christ started his church. He got, called together his disciples. And look where we're at today. Christianity. Look where it's at today with over 1,200 different denominations in America alone. 
Over 450 English translations have been done since the early days. Now, certainly oh, some of those are not available today. Some of those early English translations, well, actually I shouldn't say that they are. They have been reprinted. i got a book right over here that's got the first five English translations in it side by side. You can compare them verse by verse. You can compare them. And they pretty well line up. Except for one or two of them. Out of the five, out of the five there's at least three of them. You got the, the King James, the Tyndale, and uh, the Geneva Bible. Those all three were taken from the Hebrew and the Greek, straight from that. Nothing else. Like I said, we'll get into that when we get to it. When we get to 1611, we get to the time when those Bibles come into play here, we'll let you know. But our Lord, He suffered and died. In the 33 A.D. time period, suffered and died and arose from the grave during the time of Pentecost. After arising from that grave for a 40-day time period there, he was seen no less than three times by the apostles. One, and two of those times, he was they were inside a locked room, and he appeared in the midst of them. And because of that, some people was oh, he was just a spirit. He was just a spirit. But he said, no, here, touch my hands. And doubting Thomas. Thomas didn't believe because he wasn't there the first time. He doubted. And then when he appeared to him, he said, here, I mean, we might also say this, the first time he ate. He ate in the presence. The spirit has no need to eat. But he ate to show them that he was a living, he was alive. It was that same Jesus whom they saw crucified, whom they saw buried. It was that same body that it was perfect without sin, that God, he rose it from the grave. He was resurrected. He was brought back to life. That physical body was brought back to life. And yes, he'd been glorified at this point now. He had received all power and all authority. He was one in control. Now, they, being there in that room, and, he, and especially the second time when Thomas was there, he said, here, touch, the, touch these hands. Touch these scars on my hands. Touch here the spear wound in my side. That, and I'm sure that the other injuries, the scars on the forehead and around and the, uh, on the head and the face, were that the thorns pierced his brow. I'm sure that stuff probably still there too. And where they had beat him and beat him, and hit him, to a point where he was almost unrecognizable. The Bible doesn't tell us that that was healed. That he, that was because the hands weren't healed. Or there were scars. There were scars. Maybe, maybe it was healed to the point where you could say the scars were sealed. We don't know. We can't say for sure all that. But he, but he was alive. He was a living being of flesh and blood right there. That holy, righteous Son of God who rose from the grave and was there in their midst. Met with him there two times in that locked room. So all that he got in there, how to get in there? He's God. Uh, you know, how can people overlook that? Uh, this, uh, you know, we live in a day and time where there's so much science fiction and fantasy, and you know, like they got such wild visions or wild ideas. You get the science fiction of Star Trek, where they beam people in and out of places, and other uh, fantasy that talks about people being able to teleport and do all this kind of stuff. You know, we've got these wild imaginations and dreams which people have thought up, and when it comes to God, oh, it's so limited. We just can't uh, comprehend how he can come and be there and be uh, appear in that locked room where they were at. And no man able to get in without, you know, busting in, breaking down a door. And all of a sudden, there he is, the Son of God. He is God. He's the second member of the Godhead. And he can will himself to be wherever he wants to be. Locked door or not, closed windows or not, if he wants to will himself to be there in the room with you, he'll be there. And that's what he did. Now, he also appeared uh, out there on the shore when they were fishing, third time he met with them. Uh, Paul also tells us he appeared before a great number of people. Forty days, for forty days, he's walking and he's appearing to people, showing himself that he's alive. And that brings us to the book of Acts. For in the first chapter of Acts, you see these things talked about there. And what is happening from day 40 to day 50 in the first chapter. That church which he established, 
And it had all authority at this point to go unto this world and preach the gospel. It was a church. There was 120 some names according to the chapter on the roll as members of this first church at Jerusalem. And it was there they had met with the Lord. They'd gone out to the Mount of Olives and saw him ascend up in the sky and watching there in just amazement. Some people think, oh, how can he do that? How can he do that? He's God! He must be, surely he must have been a spirit. Surely he must have been a ghost. Go up there like that. Such limited imagination that people have when it comes to God and what he can do. He creates all things after all. There's not anything that exists without God having created the base elements of all this stuff that we have in our life. God created the base elements that it's all made of. He created the trees which you get our wood from, all those uh, ores which you find on the ground of metals and uh, limestone, all that stuff that you drywall and your stone buildings are made out of, your glass, everything we have, even our plastics. Man didn't make these things on his own. God, God created the base elements of all these things, and here they are. Now, it's all part of our history. All part of the history of this world. And the Lord, having ascended up, and then those two angels appeared and said, Why stand you here gazing up? He's going to come back in like fashion. My friends, the church has been doing the will of God. His churches have been doing the will of God, taking this gospel to this lost and dying world, because that's what he said to do. Go into all the world and preach unto everyone, every creature. Talk about all mankind. There's no need to preach to the animals. They don't have souls. Christ did not die for the animals. And let me say this too. I see some things in old statements of faith. The implication that he died for angels. Show me that in scriptures. Show me where there is one moment of God saying to those angels that fell in rebellion following Satan where there's any place in scriptures where God said I'll send someone to die for you to redeem you it's not there only to a fallen man has he sent the gospel message of hope of salvation to repent and believe upon the Son of God that you might live that you might have life that you might have it abundantly my friends, that's just one of the examples of how religions have corrupted the Word of God. They made false statements that are not backed up by the Word of God, and it's not so. Christ did not die for anyone but men, for mankind, for those specifically that the Father gave him. And he said, of those the Father gave me, I'll not lose one of them. And he's not just talking about the twelve. He's talking about the others also that were not a part of that group of people, that first church which he called together, those Old Testament saints, all the New Testament saints, and if we are believers, if we're saved by the grace of God, then we are saints. We've been sanctified, we've been set apart for service toward God, and this is the beginning of the teaching of the history of the New Testament church age and the Word of God. As our time is quickly running out from us here again, my friends, we encourage you to like, share, and subscribe to this if you want to keep up with this. If you want to learn, listen to what we have here to tell you. We have many historical books which we've looked to, which we're going to bring out history here to you of what has happened and what has come to pass. May God bless you and may God help us as we're going to run this out here. I may have just a few seconds. Uh, but uh, may God help us to set before you these wonderful things of truth that God has for us to know and understand.